Gregoire and Dan Beeson are smart enough to know better. Welcome to Smart Enough to Know Better, a podcast of science, comedy and ignorance. I am Greg Waugh. And I am Dan Beeston, or at least what's remaining of him, minus the left eardrum. Because I'm very excited. This is episode 58.0, and that voice you heard at the start of the podcast was none other than Australia's own Dr. Carl Krushineski. Yes, everyone knows Dr. Carl in Australia, and many people around the world know him too. Yeah, yeah. Because he's on, he's on the radio go, in Britain. If you go to, uh, to iTunes... And look in the science podcast list. <laughs> he takes up like the, the first eight positions he's, or something. He really is. He's, he's and a powerhouse. And then comes smart enough to know better. Somewhere well, you there. have to scroll. Yes. You have but to scroll. But we're there. We're there. But we can get higher if you guys uh, jump nice. into iTunes and give us a big five-star rating. And you might be wondering... Why have they got Dr. Carl at the start of the interview podcast? Have they, have they got an interview with Dr. Carl? Could this be? Could this be? No, that is not the answer. <laughs> but we did get him to say the intro. And yes, that's, 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 that's good. gangbusters. That's, I'm pleased about that. Woo! We've got something better. We've got something much, much better than Dr. Carl talking on our interview. We, you know, Richard Dawkins. I do. We do not have him either. We, we don't have him either. No, no. no. But we have the next one. <laughs> that's right. The so, next Richard Dawkins, that, quote, unquote. Yeah, well, the quote goes before you say it. Oh. But yeah. But, that, but no. Oh, like, probably, your, probably, yeah, we've got the, quote, next Richard Dawkins, unquote. unquote. Mm. Ah. That, was a, that must have been a double unquote. <laughs> Does that mean it's still quoting? Anyway, this week in science, anything scientific happening in your life, Dan? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. After the last podcast, mm. I listened to your advice, yes. Gregoire. I got up at four o'clock in the f***ing morning <laughs> to look at Comet Ison. Yes. And you know what I saw? What's that? Bupkis. We live in a major city. Bupkis. Did you see it at all? I heard that it was going to be this giant uh, flaming spire on no, the horizon. No, no. It was many, it was many going to be pulsing <laughs> and making noise. <laughs> many, many, many months ago, Comet Ison was promoted as potentially the comet of the century. Not as it came past or towards the sun as it did, but when it came back again, when it left the sun, it oh, came past us again. Great. So we get the Bob him to the stick, and those Americans and those Europeans in the Northern Hemisphere get all the magic once again. Well, I hope they're happy with themselves. Not particularly. All we got was a little tiny comet, yep. a little green comet, a beautiful majestic candle in the, in the sky, <laughs> and what do they get, Greg? Well, maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing entirely. No. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it went through perihelion very soon, uh, very recently, sorry. It went past the sun, uh, and the, they were looking for with all the cameras, Soho and, and Stereo and these other satellite cameras looking near the sun, and it didn't seem to come back. And to begin with, everyone was like, uh-oh, it died. Because uh -oh. they're talking about a lot of, a lot of uh, carbon dioxide frozen and ice and, and water ice and all sorts of things, dust, and going past the sun. And I mean really close to the sun. <laughs> uh, and the sun, as you may not realize, is actually a really big ball of... Um, light and energy and it's really quite hot yeah and it produces a lot of radiation and yeah and to begin with they went it's dead and i very bravely went it's dead and then about two minutes later went it's alive son of a monkey uh and and basically it's been a wonderful though it does seem to have something here survived they, they found the coma as in they found the gaseous bit and, and they've been looking closer at it and they think that some chunk of the nucleus has survived it's not very bright it's not it's it hasn't done very well it's, it's covered in, in charcoal pretty much it's been very serious Seriously damaged on the way through. It's still there, but we don't think it's going to be the comet of the century anymore. People are like, no, no, we don't know. But it's really amazing. Is is we've learned so much. Like watching this comet come in, this long period comet that came from the Oort cloud a long time ago, came barreling on in at like hundreds of kilometers a second, grazed the sun around the part we couldn't see, and now it's come back. I mean, we're going to learn things. People are like, it's dead. It's alive. It's a zombie. We don't know what's going on. Is it big? Is it small? Is it how? And, and the answer now, we sort of, by the time you get this podcast, we probably know a lot more about it, to be honest. And, and it's, it hasn't done well. Yeah. It has Ice not done zero, well. Chad won. Chad won. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Peter Bokosian. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You are a man who promotes critical thinking, a man who has gone out of his way to try and make people think 
better? Would that be a fair enough thing to say? It would be indeed. How does one actually think better? I don't have a clue. <laughs> and that's the interview. <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there, there are many ways to think better. The key, though, is, is not just to have a way to think better. It's to actually use the results of the skill set that you have. That's the tricky part. It's actually bring it into it. So actually not just thinking about it, but actually do it at the end. Yeah. So there are so, so many books on critical thinking. I I can't, I mean, there are just hundreds and most of them are, are quite good. Some are outstanding, but the key is that almost anybody can acquire that critical thinking skill set, but using it, developing the attitudinal disposition to use those skills that's an entirely different matter. That's the tricky part. You can think about it like this. Uh, I talked about this in my, my Easter Bunny talk. <laughs> it's much better to stop believing things that are false than it is to try to believe things that are true. There's just more bang for the buck that way. Uh, okay. So I should probably question something to begin with. Who is Dr. Peter Boghossian? What Where's your background? Like, How do you come into this area? Oh, boy. I've been... Ben, boy, that's a huge question. So I've been thinking about this stuff. My doctorate is in it. My research is in it. I've read about it virtually, no, not even virtually. I think every day or thought about it. I've certainly thought about it every day for mm. 30 years. It's my passion, mm. critical thinking and teaching people how to think critically and figuring out what that entails. Right, okay. So why... Why is it important to get people to stop believing things that are not true? Surely it's okay to keep them in a nice bubble of, of self-delusion as they move through life? So why do you want it? Just... <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to cause some alarm there. I'm sorry about that. Uh, basically, it's, it's, I mean, so it's, it's, not a, it's not okay for people to believe untrue things. If, if they're not hurting anyone, is that that's still not okay? Like if they're just like going through life it's slightly deluded, but basically separated and not doing bad things, is that okay? Well, you really have to unpack what you mean. Uh, you know, I'm not the arbiter of reality. So whether or not that's okay is right. Whether or not that's okay is not really up to me. It's up to the, it's up to the people. The problem is that many people, they think that they've latched their beliefs to reality when in fact that they haven't. Mm. That they haven't. And so sometimes if you point some things out to people, they might be surprised or offended or taken back. But part of the question can be answered if if you think it's possible for a person to have a private belief. Yes, that, and that's this the difficult part. It's going to affect your life somewhere, I suppose. It's going to well, it has to. It's, it's going to change the way you behave and the way that you think. I would think so. I mean, I thought about that question for years now, and that's the conclusion that I've come to. Mm. But I'm certainly willing to change my mind about that. <laughs> Like getting people to forget, well, to get people to unlearn what is not true. I've discovered in my life that if you try and say something to someone, because I mean, I, I even just scientific things, things that that um, I have a science background, and I try and just teach science, and sometimes someone will come up with a. Uh, they they knew this about you know about maybe like acupuncture or some sort of aromatherapy and you go well actually the evidence doesn't seem to back up what you're saying there. Like there's been a lot of peer reviewed science and it doesn't back up what you're saying. And you normally get either anger. Or you get denial. You just go, well, you're wrong. I, I've had personal experience. Denial of science. There are more things dreamt of in yes. your philosophy, yes. Gregoire. Are you like, no, no, everything's testable. It, no, it's not testable. And it makes it very difficult. So, it, I mean, is there ways of, of getting people to, I mean, if you had that experience yourself, and people just seem to just go, no, I don't believe you, or I'm angry at you for, for going against my beliefs. That's what my whole book is about, A Manual for Creating Atheists. Mm-hmm. I talk about exactly that. And I, I think the question of anger is a particularly interesting one, because... The reason that people would would feel anger is because they haven't proportioned their beliefs to the evidence. Mm. So if if you proportion, and think about this, this, I think this is super interesting. If you proportion your belief to the evidence, then when somebody asks you a question, you present the evidence. Yes. So we all we all implicitly assign confidence values to beliefs, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, how sure are you that you exist? Well, you're a hundred percent sure. How sure are you that the Earth existed before you were born? I mean, I don't know, like 99.99%. And then, you know, how how sure are you that your uh, girlfriend isn't sleeping with the mailman? I mean, I I don't know what value you could assign to that. But, so <laughs> you we, haven't we seen have... Greg's mailman. That's true. He's a he's, he's a, quite a mailman. <laughs> he is kind of is. Unfortunately, he is very male indeed. <sighs> so so we, we assign confidence values, and the problem comes when the confidence value 
we've assigned is not in proportion to the evidence we have. The only mechanism, the only way that one can respond is being offended, is being angry, is being outraged, is being indignant. Mm. But you wouldn't have to be any of those things if you assigned a lower confidence value to your beliefs. Right. So the more you believe something, the less you have to emotionally invest in it. Is that, is that right? Well, if, if you believe, if you accord your beliefs to the evidence, then there's no need to get offended by anything. Yes, I, I can see what you're saying there. So, for example, I'm pretty certain that the sun will rise tomorrow. Uh, it has yeah. every day of my life and all my knowledge of nuclear fusion. It's not, the sun is not likely to die anytime soon in the next fusion couple Fusion or fission? Fusion. Sun's fusion. Fusion. Yeah. So, right, yeah. Good. 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 Thanks, Dan. And, Just checking. <laughs> and so, everyone on the same page. So, tomorrow morning, I'm pretty certain the sun's going to come up. So, if someone go, runs down the street screaming, the sun's dying and it won't come up tomorrow, I don't feel emotionally invested in that because I'm pretty certain they're wrong no i think i think what yeah, peter's saying yeah. is that if the sun doesn't rise tomorrow and mm. you're presented with that evidence you can then go well then my beliefs are changing with the evidence well yes they, they would do that as well yes so let's say that you you say to somebody you say to me hey the sun's gonna rise i say do you think the sun's gonna rise tomorrow yes what is the confidence value of that nine nine point nine 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 percent and you say well what do you do you think the sun's gonna rise tomorrow now Keep in mind, it, it depends on the person. Maybe the person is some kind of uh, astrophysicist or something who has privileged knowledge of <laughs> cosmology. But let's just say it's a person. Not, the sun, sun's not going to rise tomorrow. If it, they say, well, why do you think that? Yeah. And they maybe they present some basic reasons. Well, you know, the problem of induction. That we can't depend on it or, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's in my uh, crystal ball. My cat told me so, but whatever. If you press somebody on that, the, the reason that they would get upset is because there's a differential, there's a difference between the evidence they have and the certainty with which they hold the belief. Yes. And if they if they want to continue, I'm, I'm sorry to use a big word, but an epistemic defense, you know, a, 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 if they want to continue the defense of the belief, hmm. then they can't do so on the basis of the evidence. So they have to defend the belief in another way. Is it a whole different part of the brain that comes in to defend it? Like like something, like you have the rational frontal cortex, but maybe some other part of the brain. I want to say irrational because I want to make it sound like we're rational and they're irrational, which is not really fair. But is it, do you think it's another part of the brain that comes barreling in to, to, to help out and therefore you kind of get this um, dichotomy of, of what you know and what you're feeling? I, I don't know. I don't know enough about cognitive neuroscience to answer your question. I, hmm. I, I will say that I've taken a turn in the way that I've thought about this, and this is in my book as well, is some kind of a covariance between the belief and the, the, the what Shermer calls the, the brain, the engine of belief, the brain. And so there's something in, in philosophy, we talk about beliefs in terms of propositions. Mm. So the, the proposition that one attaches one's belief to, and there's something in the mechanism of the brain that we tend to assign higher certainties to certain beliefs. Right. Uh, and again, if, if you read The Believing Brain, that explains it. So th that's why you asked me about critical thinking, and I was only partially joking when I said I don't know. A, lo a lot of people think they know. It it's very easy to give someone a skill set. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievably difficult to teach them or to help them use that skill set. And w one of the reasons for that is because in academia, we don't have a mechanism by which we can assess the attitudinal disposition of someone. It, look, yes, it's very yeah. easy. It's right. It's very easy for me to say. And in fact, I just gave a test last week on fallacies. So there's attacking the person fallacy. You give an example. John said to Mary, "What do you think of the death penalty?" Mary says, "I think it's good." John says, "You fool." How could you possibly say that? You have red sneakers on. That's obvious. And then people will match that. And then it's very easy for the professor to just give that a check, right? Yes, oh, yes. Mary gets it, right? But the problem is that just because somebody knows that, it doesn't mean that they'll use that in every aspect and other aspects of their life outside of the context of taking a test. Mm -hmm. So the, the trick is to help people develop those attitudinal dispositions so they can actually use what they're learning and transfer those skill sets. I absolutely agree there. Uh, my own personal example, why I've been cunning about this, it, doing post-grad work myself and and you get told to reflect a part of my a part of my assessment is uh, write this huge bit of assessment, work on all this sort of stuff, and then write a reflection. And and I don't 
I should, probably shouldn't say this too loudly, but I don't actually write a real reflection. I'm writing what I think the lecturer actually wants to hear because I don't, exactly. want to, I don't want to get them offside. I want to make sure that they read my massive amount of work and give me the best mark possible. So I'm not going to go, this was rubbish and everything you said was stupid, uh, which sometimes I think, uh, <laughs> for right or wrong. But I would never write that in, in a million, million years. I, I, our brain, oh, well, my brain, maybe I'm just a bad person, uh, my brain seems to have set up so it's like, how do I get the maximum out of that person. I've worked them out, and now I'm going to write it. But I don't actually believe it most of the time, which is, you know, not good. Yeah, it, it's difficult, and I don't – obviously, I don't know your instructor. I don't know the class. It's – And know, I won't I, be I, telling I, you because I, I don't want anyone to find out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I go to – I don't know how successful I am in this, but I go to great lengths to try to – encourage people to disagree with me and take both sides of the issues but of the issue but even beyond that i think we've created a culture in academia that makes it very difficult due to the power differentials between the teacher and the students and and just the whole culture you know mm -hmm. it's a culture of pretending you know people want to pretend to know things they don't know james randy has said once you get a, a phd it, it basically means you never say i don't know anymore <laughs> and we need right we need to that's work where really smart hard. enough no better steps in because <laughs> We really, don't we know. really, really don't know. That's very true. <laughs> yeah. So you're 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 wise, and we need to create cultures in which we value people's honesty when they say, "Geez, I, I really don't know the answer to that question." Because right now, it's exactly the opposite. Mm, yeah, it's it definitely is. It's we have an issue where. It is very hard for people to say, I don't know. And, uh, and it's sometimes when people like defending, let's just say defending science, so very much evidence-based research, saying I don't know almost feels to a lot of people that what you're saying is science doesn't work, but that's not what you're saying at all. When you say, oh, we actually know the answer to that, like someone right. yesterday was talking to me about dark energy. And, and right. it, tell me all about dark energy, and that's sort of an area that I'm studying at the moment. And, and I went, well, actually, I can tell you some information, but at the end of the day, we just don't know. I mean, we, that science cannot answer that question yet, uh, and, and that's okay. And there was a definite feeling of, oh, well, you know, then pff, it could be anything. And you're like, well, no, I didn't say it could be anything. I'm saying that we don't know. There's a two different things there. And, <laughs> and, and it was that weird moment of... Just because I don't know the answer to that doesn't get rid of everything I've just been saying for the last 20 minutes, that we do know, all the bits we do know, just not the last bit. So uh, Yeah, and, e and even beyond that, just because you don't know the answer to that, that doesn't give someone else license to pretend to know things they don't know. But yes, yeah. <laughs> that's, a very, that's a very good point. It's, it, what, is, what is it? The known knowns, the unknown unknowns, the, no, wait, the known knowns, the unknown knowns, the it known... Just love un Rumsfeld. Yeah. Rums, that was... Greatest quotation ever. <laughs> it's great. The yeah, known knowns, the unknown knowns, the the known, known unknowns. unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. That's it. Ugh, yeah. I love it. I think it's just great. And when you think about it, you got everything I know in my world and don't know. I try and go, what do I know? And then suddenly there's the unknown unknowns, which is ah, crazy. There should be a word for each one of those, uh, which would be a noun. So there'd be a known known noun and an unknown known noun. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Dan's not helping you. <laughs> Quit with the verbiage. All right. So, picked up on that. So you've written a book, Peter, that's recently come out called A Manual for Creating Atheists. And I was really, really interested because here's something that I have difficulty with. And, and in my life, I mean, I, I, am, I am an atheist uh, and I've pretty much moved away from trying to get people off religion. I, I've kind of gone, look, that's just something that's way too hard. <laughs> and, and if someone comes and asks me a question, I talk to what my, my lack of belief, not my beliefs, but my lack of beliefs and why I believe it, evidence-based. But, but a lot of the time I just feel it's, it's a fight that I'm just not willing to have because it normally turns into a fight. And as I get older, I'm just a bit tighter and I, I want to enjoy my time off. <laughs> So, so, so when I was young and in my 20s, I was like, yeah, I'll punch the world in the face. But now I'm sort of, you know, in my 30s, I'm like, oh, you know, this is hug. So is there a way of, of, of actually starting these conversations with people that doesn't rely on scratching each other's eyes out? Oh, yeah, that, that's the chapter four of my book. So I, I just want to go back to a mm. couple of things you said. So it's not about disabusing anybody of religion. It's about helping people to reason more reliably. And often these are looked at as conflicts or fights or debates, mm. and they ought not to be looked at that way because any time if, if one does conceive of it that way and one does speak to people that way, that just makes one adopt an adversarial mm. stance, mm. Uh, and you don't, you don't want to do that. So it depends what your, your goal is. One of the, the things that I talk about 
extensively in the book is how to help people reason more reliably. You know, we, we talked about before but not believing things that are false mm. being more important than believing things that are true. Mm. It's very similar. I mean, that, that principle seems to hold with everything. It's like diet. It's it's more important to not eat plutonium than it is to eat broccoli, right? So don't... don't right? <laughs> I want so, that on a shirt. <laughs> so so don't don't eat things that are terrible for you, right? It's, it's mm. more important to not smoke than it is to I don't do X, but that that idea that the same thing applies in the domain of reasoning. It's more important to not use terrible ways of reasoning than it is to use good ways of reasoning like the scientific method. Mm. It's more important to not use faith-based processes to know the world than it is to use the scientific method. And if we can just help people to use less worse ways of reasoning, we'll all be better off. I can see that. That does. That makes. That actually makes a lot of sense. So, how, and, and it's a it's a modest ambition. Don't people need like if you take away their their way of reasoning, it, whether it be faith based or whatever, don't they need to replace that with something, or else they'll have no way of reasoning and be incapable of. Do, do you mean to create a vacuum and that will happen naturally? No, I don't. Why does that follow? Up? Why does it follow that if you take away a bad way of reasoning? Well, I don't know. The whole society is going to call apart. If, if you take away a bad way, for example, you know, if, oh, if you like homeopathy, you dilute this so much. And so, so if you help people understand that that's not true, why does taking away a bad way of reasoning mean that somebody's going to use a worse way of reasoning, like trying to cure an infection by taking a chainsaw and cutting their arm off? It, it doesn't follow, right? It's, so, yeah, I think I think understand that Dan was thinking in general, but you're talking about specific examples like homeopathy or cutting your arm with a chainsaw. I, I think I understand the difference there. So, what, I think Dan. Yeah, no, his, yep. his, 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 question, his question was an excellent one. His question was an excellent one. I, I guess I've never understood why helping people see that a way of reasoning they're using is, is not going to help them align their beliefs with the truth mm. would then mean that. They're either going to adopt a more, a worse, an even worse way of reasoning, or they're somehow going to be, you know, a moral anarchist and, you know, go out and shoot people or something crazy. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I've never understood why why one would even think that. It's uh, from the inside. That's, I mean, very much so. I've had this conversation quite a few times with people people of faith and and in quite a friendly setting and people sort of say oh, without without religion without that sort of way of thinking then you've got no moral compass and, and i always sit there and stare at them and go that well i've been an atheist for quite a long time um have i gone and murdered anyone <laughs> and it's like I, i'm not I'm, that we found out about that that's, i'm a very clever murderer but it's it's that thing of I, I never understand i'm the evidence i sit there and go well hang on i'm the fact that there's a you can have a moral compass without having a religion it's it, it is possible people you're just an aberration I, that's what it is yes i'm the i'm the thing that the the uh that proves the rule well, but that's on your resume isn't it <laughs> Greg Wah, aberration. Well, yeah, we could go run in many directions with the conversation. We could talk about it morally. We could talk about it epistemologically, like how you know. Mm. We could talk about it in terms of meaning. Like man, many people seem to think that if God is the ultimate meaning, then only through a God or some kind of ultimate meaning could their lives have any meaning whatsoever. Mm. Yes. I find that to be an unbelievably disparaging an incredibly sad and tragic way to live your life. Mm. But it's, 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 I think it's, to me it's like a club. It's kind of like going, it, it makes yourself feel better. I mean, once again, I'm just, I'm, I don't want to talk for people who are, I don't really understand the way they're thinking, so I, I can't really say this is what they're thinking. But to me, it's like going, oh, if, if, I was part of, if we were part of the Smart Enough to Know Better Club, Dan and I are part of this amazing club called Smart Enough to Know Better, and we say, hey, Peter, come join our cool club. It's cool. It's all the best stuff. And you're like, no, thanks. I don't really want to. And then we just go, well, you're missing out because we've got all the cake. You know, it's, 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 it's that thing of we've, cake? we've got, <laughs> we've got, sorry, Dan, there's no cake. Dan's looking for cake. Why, so, would, you, why, why, no, why, why would you promise me it's, that? It's magic cake when you get when you die. So it's, that's, that's, oh no, I've I, created a religion. Can't wait to die. <laughs> so it's, I think people well, have to see the better move? about themselves. Okay, do you see the move you just made though? You, you made a move that's in a, an inevitable trajectory. You made the move from this is true mm. to this will make you feel good. Yes. Yeah. I... So we, the conversation has to keep on this is true. Right. I'm I... not willing to have that conversation unless the person with whom I'm speaking explicitly acknowledges it's not a path to truth. You know, the, someone did a study a few years ago about uh, the highest self-esteem 
was, I can't remember the exact study, but it was uh, gangsters in California had extraordinarily high self-esteem levels by various uh, metrics and constructs from the literature. But again, we're talking about, if we're talking about religion or if we're talking about faith, then the question becomes, is that process of knowing the world more likely or less likely to align your beliefs with truth. Mm. And that gets back to what we talked about before. If one doesn't have enough reason to believe something, then what they do is they have to make up for that reason some other way, like being offended or insulted. And inevitably, and I talk about this in the book, people will make that switch from my faith is true to it makes me feel good. You know, you can have magic underwear or a magic cake. Mm. So just make sure when you have conversations, you don't let the conversation go there until people explicitly say to you, you know what? Faith is not true, but it makes people feel good. So why shouldn't we let that happen? Okay, then you should have that conversation. That's it. I had a conversation about this very recently where a a colleague who I work with sort of made made a comment about having, having faith, but... The, the, that colleague sort of said, oh, but it's, it's just something that, that I don't know. I don't know if it's real or not, and, uh, and it makes me feel good. They actually said that, and I feel happy of thinking that. And I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. And it was that, that, that weird moment of, I don't know why you're telling me this. It was over lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks. Um, I, I think it's because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I'm a little bit more out there about what I don't believe. So, but I don't push it in people's faces. But people ask me, I go, I don't, I don't believe. I, and I'm flat out, I don't hide behind it anymore. So it was, it was a weird moment of, they, they, they said that exactly so then. Oh, it makes them feel better. They feel better thinking that but at the end of the day it didn't seem to impact their life in the way that they still did their job in a scientific background in a very scientific way which always fascinates me so just jumping sideways here have you discovered this peter i'm always fascinated by you can have someone who who is absolutely science-based in their job so they they follow the scientific method they're a chemist or they 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 work in research and they just go bang 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 evidence-based and they write all these papers and they're really really high up in the scientific community but on the other hand they have this really strong underlying faith and i just sit there and go how do you join those two together like i I, like like, these two areas of your lives which are really important i I just don't know maybe i'm just too simple a bear to understand (laughs) do you know what i'm saying there's a there's a lot there so i'll I'll just take it yeah so very very quickly people are good at compartmentalizing those things one two just because somebody is a scientist my colleague turned me on to this just because someone is a scientist or works as a scientist that doesn't mean they use the scientific method in other areas of their lives. It just means that they, that's their vocation, that's to do. Mm-hmm. Three, somebody said something to me that I liked and I acted upon. I don't like the phrase, and I don't use this at all in my book, in the Manual for Creating Atheists. I don't say lost your faith because when you lose something you want to get it back uh-huh. uh, i use i use abandon and the fourth thing i, I want to comment on is something that was a super interesting interaction that you had with that guy mm. here's what i would have asked him mm. so if you know your faith isn't true then how could it make you feel better yes because that's that's the key question right i mean people say that it makes them feel better but the implicit assumption in that is that it's true. But if they if they acknowledge that it's not true, or the implicit assumption, excuse me, if they acknowledge that something isn't true, hmm. then it's not clear how it can make them feel better. Hmm. Right? Yeah. This is something interesting. I was reading a book by Alain de Botton called Religion for Atheists. And in oh, that, yeah, yeah. and, and it, he's that's a that's another interesting book. Not as good as yours. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so, sorry, I'm just gonna. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm gonna suck up to my uh, to my interview here at the moment. But <laughs> the oh, you um, can talk about any, anybody's book you want. There <laughs> are no other books. No, there, Greg. There's, no, there's never been one written ever. They're, they're all the one book. Ladies and gentlemen, if you learn to read at primary school, <laughs> this is what it was for. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, and, and so in Religion for Atheists, he was talking about uh, how religion has a lot of traditions and a lot of you know, bells and smells, that kind of thing of oh, we all go at a certain time to a certain place and we all bow at a certain time. And it's all part of the communal ideal of, of what humans should do, or at least it's lots of people doing the same thing at the same time. And it makes us feel better because we're a social, social ape. And I thought that was a really good point. Uh, sometimes being an atheist... It's you don't get access to all that tradition, all those, all those. We're making out uh, brand new traditions of going on okay. the internet and making people right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on. You got to step way back again. Okay. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff in this. So th- there's a difference between in, in the book. I, I'm very explicit that this is not about people's religion. This is not about going after anybody's religion. Mm. This is about faith. 
This is about an unreliable way to know the world. You can you can participate in any ritual you want. In bowling, you can shine your ball a certain way or whatever you do. I don't know. Yep. Uh, but those rituals and those communities and those groups, that's different from a faith-based epistemology, a faith-based way to come to know the world. Mm -hmm. So this is about helping people to not use a way of knowing the world, faith, that is almost impossible if it were true. I mean, if the universe was so constructed in such a way that Zeus was the actual god, well, that would be a bummer for most of us. But well, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not about religion. It's about faith, and it's about helping people to embrace reason and disabuse themselves of a specious or a, a way of thinking about problems that won't help them to live better lives and won't make their community any better. I think from an Australian point of view, Australians are probably a bit more live and let live when it comes to religion than, than I, as I perceive Americans to be anyway. It, it, it's much more built into your politics and a lot more built into the into conversations like I watch on television or uh, documentaries and things like that. It, it, it just seems seems to be more important or more elevated in America than Australia. In Australia, it just seems to be more background. A lot of people seem to be willing just to let, just get on with it. But suddenly it rears its head. That's what I, that's what I get. It, it sort of strikes from the darkness. It just suddenly comes up as a reason where it wasn't a reason before. So I'm just trying to work out what are the most common arguments for religion and how do we actually get around them? Like, how do we, how do we, how do we sort of try and point out that they're incorrect beyond, or is it just sort of point at the facts, keep pointing at the facts? No, no. Okay, so you you absolutely don't want to. Okay, this is a huge. Every single thing you said yes. is like massive. Excellent, it's, it's massive. Uh, so you are overwhelming you, our interviewee. <laughs> Excellent, we're doing a great job. Yay. Listen to him stutter. Um, 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 he's, this, uh, uh, what, what he's thinking, what Peter's thinking is, this guy's an idiot, and he, and he doesn't realize he's an idiot. <laughs> No, I'm absolutely not thinking that at all. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking that I, that I have to make sure you speak in shorter chunks so I can try to address everything. I, I, <laughs> you sound like my mother. You. That's what my mother says. <laughs> hey, can I uh, I'm not even going to comment on that one. Uh, Please let the interviewee so, discuss what's wrong with your mother. <laughs> Do you like it? You got Go further, further back, further back, further back, further back. All right, I, I can't speak to the Australian system. I mean, mm -hmm. from from everything that that you've said, that that resonates with me is true about the differences in religiosity and how vocal and outspoken people are, and the role it plays in the political system, and even to a certain extent in contemporary jurisprudence. But again, I, I can't I can't speak to those things because I don't I don't really know. Until quite recently and quite recently before that, we actually had an openly atheist prime minister. And right. uh, and a female and a female openly atheist prime yeah, minister. She was uh, yeah. So so but the, the, the new prime minister I, I've heard is uh, uh, Yes well, well, we, we'll, leave, we'll leave we'll leave politics out of for a second. Yes. But, he he so is a man of religion. He is a man of, of belief. That's that's yeah, definitely true. Mm. He is. And what beliefs so, he has. Mm. We visit this idea. I think it's a wrong way to think about things. First, it's a wrong way to think about things in terms of an attack. This is no attack. Second of all, you, you're focusing on someone's faith, and you're basically asking a series of questions to help them to figure out whether or not it's true. And while you do that, you're also trying to figure out, hey, maybe it is true, and if it is true, then I should believe it, right? Mm. So somebody has a way of reasoning that's more reliable than my own, then I ought to adopt that that reasoning. So that's that's one thing you're doing, but it's hard to make that conceptual shift. It's hard to make that shift in the conversations that you have with people that it's not about religion. It's about faith and the way that people come to their conclusions. I mean, it, it, again, and I'll, I can't speak for Australia, but I'll speak for this country. I am flabbergasted when I listen to some politicians speak, and currently... It, it, the Republican Party is hijacked by religious maniacs. Mm. The premise that they have, they, they drive their entire public policy system based upon a book that was written in the Bronze Age. Yes. Which, which is an absolutely astonishing. I mean, if you just let, let that idea detonate in your brain, that is just an absolutely astonishing way to conduct public policy. Mm. Mm. For, for, for no other reason that we have much better medals than bronze these That's days. That's right. Bronze is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm, I think we've missed I'm, the point I'm, again. Uh, I think we've missed the point. <laughs> I can hear it. In, I can hear it in Peter's voice. I can, I can hear the tone. 
no, I mean, it's, 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 I guess it's funnier to you guys because you don't have to deal with it. No, you know? it's like, yeah, we, have, we can easily make light of it. <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 uh, <laughs> but this is, this is something, this is serious business, man. Mm. I mean, this is something that affects all of us, all, all of us being Americans. Mm. It, it affects, me and it affects people I know and people I care about in my mm. community and people I love every single day. And you know, it's even worse because we've become, to a large extent, the laughing stock of the world in in, in so many areas. But it's this very serious problem. And mm. going after or thinking, conceptualizing the problem as religiously based is a mistake. Look, think about it like this: you guys study critical thinking. So if the premise that you start off with is incorrect, then if your conclusion is correct, it's only correct by luck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It, that's, that's, yes. Okay. That's, that follows, right. yes. Uh, so I'm clear so far. Okay, cool. So the problem is that people have these, in this country, people have these premises that the Bible being basically true or true, and then the edicts in the Bible for how to live, and then we should carry these principles into modernity. Mm. And those are the starting premises, and then the conclusions that one comes to when one starts with the premise that we should adopt the values of the Bible, those conclusions cannot possibly be correct. Or, or they could, but they're correct by luck. It's purely by luck. That's right. Yes. It's not, it's not because it's divine, divinely inspired. It's just maybe that basically the, I mean, the good part of the Bible I like in the New Testament is pretty much like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's everyone be cool. You know, everyone, everyone be excellent to each other. And if you just follow that in life, you're probably going to get... You're going to do pretty well, actually. Uh, but that, yeah, I, I don't think that's a religious thing. I think that's just a humans being cool to each other kind of thing. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, living, living in this living in this country and seeing the political system is so divided and so mm. fractious and so contentious and, and frankly, very candidly, so uncivil. Mm. Mm. Americans, I mean, I never, I asked my dad, who's in his seventies, about this, and he said that he never remembers a time in his life where it's been so uncivil. It's, and it's yeah, it's very ahead. dramatic over there, it, and that it does to feel that way to us. To the, uh, yes. the enjoyment of politics is people can get uh, enthused and emotional about it, and people like being emotional. Mm. So it's a, which is kind of the uh, the antithesis of wanting to deal with reality. Yeah, yeah, do the right and, and actually do and the reason. right thing. It is, no, it is it is very difficult, and and and, and not being try not to be too flippant here either. On the on this side of the Pacific Ocean, it is difficult here because um, for, for example, such as. Um, uh, uh, gay marriage. That's something that's really big in Australia at the moment. And certain, certain of our states have decided yes, that well, one of our states has decided yes, uh, homosexual people can be married, And but now the federal government wants to overturn that. They're saying, oh, no, 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 we can't possibly have that. So we have that problem as well as, as something from the Bronze Age, is telling people what they can do now. But no one, it, beyond, beyond the feeling that, oh, the Bible says it, or it makes us feel a bit weird, that's, that they're the only reasons that we seem to have for it, and, I, and no one seems to be able to question that it always seems to be well why not i don't have a problem with it but the answer always seems to be religion or it makes me feel right. a bit funny let, let, let me use this example look sure eating a plate of of i wrote i actually published a paper about this eating a plate of live maggots is disgusting hmm. yet nobody says that we should make a law against eating a plate of live maggots hmm. so there are a lot of things and jonathan Haidt has some really interesting literature on, on disgust and there is a, a, some really interesting literature around the idea of disgust. I don't deny for one second that homosexuality can disgust some people. Mm. My, my own personal opinion, and I have evidence to back this up, is that the more one gives the verbal behavior of being disgusted, that is, the louder one screams one's disgusted, mm. the more likely it is that they themselves are homosexual. Uh, <laughs> Right? Yeah, I, I, yes, you, you're secretly interested in what you're trying to do is yell down yourself, really. Yeah. Mm. So, I've heard so this before. They, yeah, so, and I can give you some fascinating studies on that. Just think about there are people who spend an awful lot of time being disgusted about homosexuality. Mm. I don't think about homosexuality for well, no. with two men for one second. No. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. <laughs> And the and the male gaze makes its presence known. A sexy caveat. Mm. No, I, I mean I, I think that that's I think that that's important, and I think that that notion of being dis disgusted and 
again, that's the difference between a subjective state and an objective state. So mm. we, we can feel that a lot of things are disgusting. We can, and it's a matter of taste. And if, if somebody claims that they're disgusted by something, I'm, I'm not in any position to, to tell them that they're not, they, they don't find something disgusting. Mm. But the fact that they then want to make a law out of it. I want to say one more thing. Mm. So it's interest, It's interesting to me how, and it's it's tragic, how I see this unfolding in, in politics. It's just so disturbing to me. You know, I mean, whether it's it's Rick Perry who prays for rain. I just heard the craziest thing. I thought it was a joke that Sarah Palin said that Jesus celebrated Easter. Oh, that's um. That's, 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 uh, okay. It, took, it uh, took you guys a second to get that, right? Y- yes. Uh, because it's so it's so crazy. Yeah. But yet she she, she was one two, three heartbeats away from the president. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, she, she's she's not only a national disgrace. She should be a laughing stock. But so many people. Well, she's a hero. She's some great kind of rogue. Mm. And I, I don't I don't understand. I mean, we are in a very serious state in this country. The mm. anti-intellectualism is rampant, that we, we no longer have a viable two-party system. Mm. Uh, you know, the, de- the Democrats, I, uh, oh boy, they're almost worthless. The Republicans are hijacked by, by really people who have some very serious delusions. Mm. It, it really puts people in a difficult situation. I mean, this is a, hard, this is a really tif- difficult situation. We, we face some really, really serious problems. It's very serious. I always wondered, in, when I sort of look at politics, not just, I mean, all politics, sometimes I go, does that person really believe that? Or are they just saying that because they know that there's a percentage of the population who will vote for them if they say it? And, and then, to me, I do, then I go, is, is one better than the other here? Because one is a person who's deluded, and one's a person who's conniving, and then neither of them do I want to be in politics <laughs> running my country. <laughs> It's, it really worries uh, me either you, way. You've got some very naive people running the country. Well, all very naive people, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. It's... When, when people criticize politicians bitterly, they need to look in the mirror mm. because politicians mirror the electorate. And mm. the electorate right now is is not in good shape. We Frankly, not. I hate to make these gross generalizations, but we don't have the intellectual capital that we need to make better decisions. I can't remember the statistics about people who believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. Uh. <laughs> over 50% of the population, uh, we do not, of the U.S. population, I can't speak for Australia, but they don't accept the facts of evolution. Hmm. Second, secondly, in Turkey, if memory serves me correctly. I mean, this is very, the state of science is being compromised in our K-12 system. These are very serious problems. And up till now, many atheists and secularists and skeptics have just complained and screamed and shouted about the problem. And my book tries to actually do something about the problem. I want to do something about this. I don't just want a powwow mm. where everybody sits around and talks about how angry they are. Yeah, or how good it used to be. And that's a very good point. So in, in your book, The Manual for Creating Atheists, uh, one of the things I was interested in is you had in your, one of your chapters is called After the Fall, which is right. once you've had that conversation with someone and you try and fill the gap, because it's a big gap to try and fill in someone's life. If, if they're going through a crisis of faith or abandoning a faith, which is probably a good way of putting it, as you said before, what is, how do you fill that void? I mean, do you let them sort of struggle around crazily, or, or is it something you can do constructively? Yeah, after you read Chapter 7, here's what you do. Uh, <laughs> I, I, keep, uh, I keep cards in my wallet, and I introduce them to community resources like CFI and the Center for Inquiry. And I have a friend, uh, Bernie, who's a humanist minister, and uh, he's given me permission to give them his email address, and I encourage them to. Can, I have a can community ask, online. Can, I ask, can yeah. I ask what a humanist minister is? That's a, I've not heard that term before. Oh, he basically has ministerial duties. I think he might actually be marrying a, 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 one, an ex student of mine. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure, but. I'll put you in touch with Bernie, and you can ask him. Okay, sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, oh, oh, so after the fall. Yes. So basically, one one way is to maintain contact with someone after you've helped them to abandon their faith and to learn about science and ways to think about reality that are more constructive or at the very least less dangerous. Mm. And it's through tapping the community resources. There's going to be a Sunday assembly here pretty soon. I don't know if you know too much about that. But so anyway, the the, the answer to your question is community resources, relationships, friends. Mm. I've, I'm friends with so many people I, I've helped to abandon their faith. Mm. You know, I invite them to jujitsu or I go out to lunch with them. 
Uh, my time has been in extra short demand, but there's always time to, to help people to make sure that they don't fall back into communities of delusion. I think that's a re- we made a very good point there. This, this is a lot of the time, uh, like, uh, people have, they get a lot of uh, social enjoyment about it, going to, to church or something like that, to synagogue. They, they enjoy the social aspect of it. And, and I've actually had someone say that to me, is, you know, religion just gives them somewhere to go and, and you know, they, they bake sales and they can do good things. And it's one of those points I was thinking, well, actually, that's a good point. It's changing now, but a lot of the time with, with atheists or humanists, we don't don't seem to have that feeling of, hey, let's go over there and help those people by cooking, making cookies and selling them. You know, and, and we don't seem to have that as much yet. Do you think that's changing? Do you think you'll start seeing atheist organizations more philanthropist-based, more grassroots-based? I think so, but I mean, ultimately it's an empirical and historical question. I don't really know. I mean, it certainly seems like that, but maybe that's just because I'm in a little bubble. So, <laughs> Yes, I think we you know, are. It's difficult. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I would certainly hope so, but I don't know. Hmm. And in that, but what you were saying before, that seems to be the, the answer to me is if, if you want to get someone, if you want to help someone go from a, what, thinking badly to thinking well, you've got to make sure that you offer them a very similar thing, which is at the end of it, they, they're still going to get the social connections they might have got from their faith or they might, that, that feeling of, of um, being a part of a tribe. Being part of a tribe. Yeah, that's probably a good way of putting it, Dan. Thank you. Being part of something. And if, if, being part of, if that's not being part of God or you know, some sort of spiritual entity, then maybe, maybe it has to be just being part of humanity. Dan had an excellent point. He's 100% correct. And that's why there are non-epistemic reasons for belief. People will adopt beliefs maybe because of social pressures, maybe because, or they'll at least pretend to adopt beliefs, mm-hmm. maybe because other people want, you know, they want to reap the rewards of being a person who seems to believe this or appears to believe this or so yeah it's it's a very complex very 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 complex phenomenon what people believe and why they believe it part of the problem is that it's essential that people don't slip back into those relationships and friendships in which people will say things and i write about this in in the book people will say things like oh we'll just pray about it Mm. (laughs) <laughs> so it's that that's a right because that's a type of confirmation bias that asks someone to start with a certain belief mm, and then yep. hear their epistemic life around that belief. So it's essential that people have new outlets, new communities, and the internet is is good for that. But there's really nothing like face to face personal relationships and interactions with people. Exactly right. I think it's really really important to, for people to try and be just people. Be, be be nice to each other, and uh, and you find that a lot of people are just looking for someone to chat to and to be around. It's it's just so important. This has really wet my appetite for this sort of information. Where can we get access to this book of yours? A manual for creating uh, atheists. Amazon.com. Amazon.com. Excellent. Easy. That's it's on Amazon. Fantastic. Yep. And if they want to follow you on Twitter, you're at Peter Bokoshian. Is that right? Yep. At P-E-T-E-R-B-O-G-H-O-S-S-I-N. And I also have uh, tons of free stuff on YouTube, videos. Uh, I just had a TAM talk that came out, and I have a nice chat with Richard Dawkins that's on YouTube. That's, and uh, you've, been described, you've been described as the new Richard Dawkins. That, I've heard that as in, in the description for yourself. That's a, that's a pretty... Nah, what's, uh, don't believe, no, no, no way. Don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> okay. I, I was, my question was going to be, what, what was wrong with the old Richard Dawkins? <laughs> we, yeah, we, don't don't, don't, <laughs> don't uh, call him old Richard Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's silly. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. He'll hit so you with his all, walker. <laughs> look, everybody has a, a unique or particular contribution they, they sure. need to this. I'm motivated because I have two kids, and mm. like you said, you're in your 30s. I'm, I'm 47, so more of my days are behind me than ahead of me. <laughs> and uh, I want to make sure... Well, it's true, you know. And so you're I, not I just the new want, Richard Dawkins. You're the old Peter Bokhazian. Uh, I'm the same I'm the same guy I was. I, I just want to make sure that before I die, the world is a little more kind and a little more rational. That's probably the best thing that you could ever say, Peter. That's an awesome thing to say. Thank you very much. Peter Bokoshian has written a book which everyone listening to this podcast should race out and read. It's called A Manual for Creating Atheists. We've only just really touched on anything that's in the book today. Just really jumped from point to point. Peter's been very nice to put up with us rambling about it. <laughs> the Manual for Creating Atheists is out. Is that it for you? Is, that, is it all done? All done and dusted? No. Uh, Elbow Fish and I are working on a game and it's a party game, a fun game that teaches people how to 
think and embed critical thinking tool sets and skills to people. But but not just that, but it's what I'm super excited about is that the game works on the attitudinal disposition, and we spoke about that. Hmm. So the game, within the mechanics of the game, it encourages people to use the critical thinking skill set. So that should be out in April. And out in April. Brilliant idea. That, but it's a very, very good. A party game which actually teaches you something. And for our audience who we may not remember, David Gellier, we interviewed him for Antimatter Matters, uh, which is the Kickstarter project, which actually got up. It's going to be in existence very soon. And uh, Smarter Than For The Better will have a copy of it very soon. And we're going to play it. It's going to be very, very exciting. So we're very excited that, that you're working together to try and make this accessible to people in the real world. So it's, what, a, what a great idea. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, and, and the cool thing is that often critical thinking is just in a classroom or a certain environment, but people can let go and have a few drinks and really explore their creativity and have fun while actually really honing their reasoning skills. And that's fantastic. It will send you a deck. Fantastic. Brilliant. Look, Peter, once again, thank you very much for, for taking time out today. I know you're very busy. and, uh, Sorry, and You guys have been great. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Awesome. So I appreciate it. No problem at all. And we'll talk to you very soon. It's really exciting to talk to someone who's a major thinker in, in the atheist slash skeptical community. Yeah, we're minor thinkers. We are very minor thinkers. <laughs> we're, we're really reflectors of other people's geniuses. I, I don't even just stand... We're mirrors. On, we're, we're scientific mirrors. Right. I, uh, people say, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Dan and I... We, can't, we clamber on the yeah, shoulders. We, we really do. We, we, we grip ro- tenaciously to their back hair of giants. <laughs> Hopefully, waving our hands wildly at them, going, "We're here, giants! We're here! Please don't <laughs> scratch that itch." Uh, but thank you to Peter Boghossian for, for t- chatting to us. It's very exciting to chat these sort of people, learn things. Whenever I hear his last name, I envisage the bad guy in Dukes of Hazard, Boss Hog. Boss Hog. I always think Boss Hogian. <laughs> like, Damn Dukes <laughs> with their religion and their religious thinking. <laughs> Which is actually pretty much on the run, money, uh, possibly. Pretty, pretty much, pretty much. Although I imagine Boss Hogg would be pretty pious as well. I think, oh, maybe probably he's, he, he wouldn't be very left wing, though. He doesn't like. No, no, I don't think so. Let's not compare Peter Boghossian with, um, with Boss Hogg. Boss Hogg. Let's not do that. Okay. <laughs> you have been listening to Dan at smartenough.org. And that other voice in your ear is none other than Greg at smartenough.org. Rate us on iTunes. That's right. Or just rate us out a window. Open the window right now and say, I'm mad as hell and I give them a five star. By the way, they, I mean, the Smart Enough to Know Better, a podcast that doesn't do a science comedy ignorance. Otherwise, your audience, as in the rest of the world, won't know what the hell you're talking about. Yep. Yeah, just, uh, just, in fact, just smartenough.org. We can, every opportunity, just yell it yeah, out. That's right. What you should do is, just like in Fight Club, you should go out and try to promote the podcast to two people. People who would, don't even listen to podcasts, just go out and promote And people you can't even normally talk to and promote it. Your homework assignment this week, that's listeners, right. is to start a fight with someone and then give them a Smart Enough No Better card. Or oh, just give them a Smart Enough No Better card and start a fight with someone else. Let's just break those two up. And you have to lose the fight. Otherwise, not Fight Club. Maybe they had to lose oh, the fight. Oh, good point. They had to lose the fight. Uh, yeah, do some, some of that uh, <laughs> culture jamming. Yes. Except... Whereas you'd be where you want when you paint over like the Coca Cola sign, just leave smartenough.org. Nice, yeah. and we'll get sued. We might get in trouble for that, mightn't we? <laughs> do not do that. No, nah, if you want us to get in trouble, do that. <laughs> Culture jam, woo! Listeners, thank you very much for listening. It's it's what you do with with great power. And remember that we love you. I love you. I love you. I'm indifferent. <laughs> That sounds better. Okay, cool. Oh, well, you sound deeper too. You become ten percent more sexy. <laughs> okay, wow, well, that's uh, that's pre- that's pretty impressive. Uh, good thing, good thing you guys don't have anything to worry about on that end. <laughs> Spliced in some Barry White. That's right. That's what it was. If I don't know, I'll just say I don't know. That sounds like that sounds like an honest way of speaking. That's that's <laughs> one third of the podcast that's taken care of right there. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> You know, it's important to be attentive to those small things. Yeah. Especially with kids, especially with your kids. And they feed, and they and you feed them in the morning and they're hungry again in the middle of the day. What <laughs> imagine that? that?